Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, Texas Parks and Wildlife, for having me and hosting me uh, to talk about our research and some of my master's research regarding the post delisting monitoring that we've been doing for the Contra water snake. And thank you to everyone who is in attendance. So let's get started. Uh, Nerodia harderi is a species that is composed of two subspecies, the Contra water snake, as well as the Brazos water snake. Both of them are endemic to central Texas uh, and endemic to their respective watersheds. So the Brazos water snake occupies the Brazos River watershed, highlighted in green, and the uh, Colorado or the Contra water snake occupies the Colorado River watershed, highlighted in red. Now, as a whole, this species is relatively small in size, not often going over three feet, uh, and this is especially small when you compare it to other Nerodia or other water snake species. Uh, studies that have followed these snakes in the wild uh, have found they don't tend to live too much uh, longer than five to six years. So their, their uh, wild lifespan is around five to six years. And they're considered habitat specialists. So in these river systems, you'll have these rocky areas that the water will flow through. And these guys are excellent at hunting minnows in these rocky riffle systems. So we're in the post delisting era. And so let's establish some historical context to catch you up uh, to where we are today. The species, the Contra water snake, was first listed as threatened in 1986. This was due to low population sizes, limited geographic distribution, specialized habitat requirements, that's like the riffle systems I was talking about, as well as habitat loss. And this is through uh, modification, through the construction of dams and reservoirs. Soon after, it was uh, established that the Ivy Reservoir was going to be created in 1990 at the confluence of the Colorado and Concho Rivers. Uh, essentially, this is in the middle of the Concho water snakes range, and there were worries as to how this uh, reservoir's creation will impact the species. So the Concho water snake recovery plan was created. And this plan looked at three primary criteria, adequate in-stream flows, viable populations of the snake throughout its range, as well as adequate migration, or in other words, gene flow is occurring between these populations. Ultimately, it was deemed that the Contra water snake met these parameters and it was delisted in 2011. So now we find ourselves in the post delisting era. The US Fish and Wildlife mandates that species that are delisted have 15 years of post delisting monitoring to ensure that the species continues to merit the delisting. And so we're looking at three primary criteria in this post delisting monitoring. Uh, that is detection of contra water snakes in 75% of sites that are sampled in a given year, detection of contra water snakes in all three primary river reaches, as well as evidence of reproduction in those primary river reaches. And which um, let's define what those are. You have the red box there, that is the upper Colorado River region. The green box is the Concho River region. And the blue box is the lower Colorado River region. So I'll refer to those regions as we go through this talk. Let's also get you oriented with our study model for this system. We have the Concho water snake pictured in the middle, and we're going to compare it to two sympatric congeners. That means that we're comparing the Concho water snake to two other species of water snake that occupy similar habitats, share similar life history traits due to a relatively recent common ancestor, and all of these snakes overlap in their geographic distribution. So we have some symbols at the bottom that will help us denote some key differences between these species. The snake symbol uh, is associated with the size, the contra water snake being smaller than the other two. The pie chart designates the contra water snake's specialist requirements compared to the more broad generalist requirements for Nerodia rhombifer and Nerodia transversa. And the negative and positive symbols denote the genetic diversity of these species that is typically lower in the contra uh, water snake and higher in its sympatric congeners. So we'll refer to this study model kind of as we go through and answer some of our questions. But first, let's get you more oriented with the actual range map uh, and, and occupied area of the contra water snake. So I've thrown together this composite uh, image, uh, basically looking at all historical and current surveys for the species throughout its range. What we can see is the last time a Contra water snake was detected in any given part of its range. So bear with me and follow, follow me through this. We're gonna start in the bottom left-hand corner where you see a lot of red. 
That is the San Angelo City area. Conch water snakes used to be found there back in the 1950s, uh, but since it's been deemed that the uh, populations there are extirpated or locally extinct. If we follow that up, we have the Concho River. And you'll notice most of it is red, and then we kind of have a green bit uh, on the Concho River near this blue circle. That is the only uh, current population that we are aware of of Concho water snakes on the Concho River. And we detected them there in May of last year for the first time in 10 years. And you'll notice uh, we've got that blue circle uh, right there in the center. That is Ivy Reservoir. You also have another blue circle at the top. It is the Ballinger area. So those two circles are considered population strongholds where we can find a lot of uh, contra water snakes at a few different sites throughout. And so this, this is kind of our focal uh, central part of their range. If we follow to the right hand side of the image, we have the lower Colorado River region. You'll notice a lot of it is red and it kind of leads down to that bottom right white circle. There is a lot of red here because uh, the Contra water snake and surveys throughout this range have not been done, especially recently. And uh, this is because uh, a lot of the la land ownership here is private. And so access to these river regions is quite limited. Uh, but uh, Let's focus on the bottom right-hand corner. We have a white circle there, and that is Bend, Texas. There was a population detected there about 30 years ago, which said that 18 kilometers of river was occupied by the Contra water snake there. However, uh, in this particular area, we've not seen uh, snakes, nor have there been surveys in 30 years since then. Uh, and so there's a question as to whether or not the snakes are still existing there, or if they've been locally extirpated. And we'll get into why they could be important later. If we then go up to the top left, Spence Reservoir circled in white there, let's take a closer look at Spence Reservoir to see uh, how habitat modification and climate change can impact the species. So here we have an image of Spence Reservoir. It was created in 1969, and here's an image from 1996. Uh, back in the 1990s, Whiting was studying the population of contra water snakes that inhabited this reservoir. And during his 1990 to 1992 study, uh, he collected in over, uh, he captured over 700 contra water snakes during that period. Now, he also cited that fluctuating water levels were constantly shifting the habitat availability along the shorelines. Going into the 2000s, uh, surveys there seem to find uh, less abundant numbers of the snake. And then we find ourselves in 2011, where the state was dealing with prolonged drought. And as a result, multiple wildfires broke out across the state. Here we see the impacts of wildcat wildfire on Spence Reservoir, essentially reducing the reservoir back to its original river basin. Today, the reservoir sits at around 25% capacity. But the last time a contra water snake was detected in this reservoir was in 2005. So this bottle, this is an example of a bottleneck, uh, which may have led to the extirpation of snakes from its reservoir, as our study and a prior study from 2013 to 2015 were unable to detect, do, detect snakes from this reservoir. So now remember that blue circle in that range map. This is Ivy Reservoir, one of the population strongholds. We can see now just how susceptible one of these strongholds for this species is to a single climatic event. Another area in, uh, in the Contra water snake that I'd like to discuss is the Robert Lee population. This is an image in 1969 on the left of Williams studying this population around the same time Spence Reservoir was created. Uh, this is a, a a part of the river just below the Spence Reservoir Dam. And he noted that there was salt cedar in the area and that he didn't have a positive outlook for the, uh, the Concha water snakes in this stretch due to this dam's creation. Uh, and in studies that have followed since then, it is generally found that snakes are extirpated or locally extinct from this 15 mile stretch downstream from this reservoir. Uh, I've added uh, a, another image, a more up-to-date image, to the right-hand side, and I've made it black and white and increased the contrast to allow us to compare these rivers uh, stretches uh, across this time span. And what we see in the 1969 image is a lot more gravel sand bank uh, in this river, whereas now 
it's a lot more vegetated. So the extirpation of snakes in this area is likely due to a, a multitude of factors, but uh, it's likely driven by environmental conditions, altered flow regimes, and this vegetative growth, uh, reducing the uh, water available in that system. So now we find ourselves in the post delisting era. So we sampled uh, to try to uh, see how the Concho water snake met up to the criteria set forth by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And in order to do this, we sampled sites in the Colorado and Concho rivers, both historical sites as well as new sites that we uh, felt Concho water snakes uh, may be at. And we typically did this uh, in, we sampled 15 to 16 sites per two week sampling period. And we did that twice in the spring and twice in the fall, uh, kind of when snake activity is highest. Uh, in terms of capturing, capturing snakes, we used passive methods through minnow traps. Uh, we put 25 minnow traps at a site for 24 to 48 hours, checking those every eight hours. And we also used visual encounter surveys. Uh, we also uh, uh, capitalized on the outreach to gain local uh, insight into uh, these populations. In terms of the data collected, we gathered GPS coordinates, morphometrics of these snakes, genetic information in the form of tail clips or um, blood draws, depending on the size of the snake, as well as fungal swabs in the form of whole body swabs and separate lesion swabs if lesions were present on the snake. Now we'll jump into that a little bit later, but first let's cover the demographic results we captured 511 water snakes. And if you don't know water snakes very well, they are a very bitey uh, defensive species, which means our hands were pretty much shredded by the end of this. We have uh, barely uh, 215 more uh, transversa compared to 213 contra water snakes. So we barely lost out to uh, the contra water snake uh, being the most abundant which actually contradicts some historical literature, which would cite the Concha water snake as the most abundant uh, water snake in its range there. Uh, the Concha water snake, we caught mostly similar amounts of adults and juveniles. And you'll notice we have an inflated number of neonate captures. Uh, essentially, throughout this entire range, we over 200 of our Concha water snake captures came from Ivy Reservoir and this upper Colorado River region. Only seven captures came from the Concho River, and only three captures came from the Lower Colorado River. Here are our results uh, in terms of number of snakes captured uh, during each survey period. We did not sample in April 2022, and the star on October 2020 designates a, a field season that was cut short due to poor weather conditions that pretty much shut down snake activity. Uh, but we see higher captures in the fall uh, compared to the spring. And if we look at our capture rates, you have our visual encounter capture rates in red and our trap capture rates in blue. Now you'll notice the trap capture rates on the Y axis to the right is a few magnitudes of order smaller than the visual encounter uh, capture rates. But generally speaking, we see two peaks and there's a biological reasoning for this. The visual encounter surveys peaked in the fall this coincides with the hatching of neonate contra water snakes. So essentially we have a lot of easier to find snakes everywhere, uh, especially near our source populations. Whereas in the, uh, in the trap capture rates, they peaked in spring. This coincides with snakes emerging from their hibernocula and uh, snakes starting to seek out mates. So you have these males that are out looking for females. So adult activity is higher in the spring, which inflates uh, those captures uh, from traps. So how did our uh, surveys uh, compare to the uh, monitoring criteria for the post listing monitoring? Well, we captured uh, contra water snakes in 35% of our sites in 2020, 20% of our sites in 2021, and 46% of sites in May of 2022. You'll notice all of those are far below the 75% set by the uh, post delisting monitoring plan. The prior study uh, done on this population or on the species from 2013 to 2015, their highest detection was 31% of sites in 2015. So between these roughly six years of surveys, we're floating at around 30 to 32% of sites uh, detecting the contra water snake. We were, for the first time uh, able in 10 years, able to uh, 
find the Concho water snake in all three river reaches. So we found that Concho river population. Uh, the last time a uh, snake was detected there was on iNaturalist in 2011. Uh, and then we found a population persisting uh, just May of last year. And we also confirmed evidence of reproduction in the Concho River and the Upper Colorado River. However, uh, we didn't quite confirm reproduction because we only had three captures in the Lower Colorado River region. But using the prior survey from 2013 to 2015, they were able to confirm uh, capture or reproduction uh, from that from that region. So that study combined, we can meet that criteria. Now. I've kind of alluded to the historical abundance of this species and how it's kind of differing. Uh, really, the biggest difference is on the Concho River. One of the best sites to capture Concho water snakes, at least historically, was at Paint Rock on the Concho River. Now, this is a highly recreated site, uh, but whenever we'd visit, uh, both the prior survey and our survey were unable to detect Concho water snakes at this location. We would routinely uh, come across decapitated cottonmouths on the left or decapitated Neurodia transversa on the right. Uh, so it may be that uh, the recreation and the human persecution in this area uh, is causing some of the absence of these concha water snakes. Uh, on Ballinger Lake, the image in the center is, uh, is another area where historical uh, studies would study the concha water snake populations. So we had concha water snakes in Ballinger Lake. However, again, the prior survey and our survey were unable to detect snakes at this site. Uh, one of the times we showed up to sample here uh, during May of last year, we found these 11 dead Nerodia rhombifer, uh, both adult and subadult. Uh, and this is, again, likely due to human persecution. So it may be having a greater role in some of these more recreated sites than we anticipate. Now, that is not the only thing that we have to worry about for this species. We also have the emergence of Ophidiomyces ophidicola, or OO for short. Uh, this fungal pathogen was first discovered in declining populations of timber rattlesnake back in 2008. Then soon after in threatened eastern Mossasaugas in Illinois, and since then it's been reported in over 28 states and at least 50 species of snake. Now OO is what causes snake fungal disease. And for a snake to contract this disease, it must first come into contact with the fungal pathogen in the environment. From there, it can penetrate the epidermis, and that's when you get some localized symptoms like skin lesions, swelling, as well as dermatitis. If the disease further progresses, the hyphae can penetrate deeper tissues, and that's when you get uh, other symptoms like subcutaneous nodules, necrosis, as well as even mortality. Now you have your immune responses, you also have behavioral responses to this disease. This is in the form of increased basking time. This can help induce fever-like symptoms to fight the, uh, the pathogen, as well as overall reduced movement. Both of these uh, increase these individuals to predation, increase their risk to predation, as well as decrease their feeding opportunities. Now there are a ton of different unknowns when it comes to this disease, as it's only been recently discovered, uh, such as differential host pathogen dynamics, as well as its current distribution throughout the U.S. But our study aims to answer some of those questions, at least locally. So what is the prevalence of OO in the Colorado River watershed? And what are the differential host pathogen dynamics between the concha water snake and its sympatric congeners? So like I said, we gathered fungal swabs from these individuals. We extracted the fungal DNA using PrepMan Ultra and amplified the DNA using qPCR. These reactions were run in triplicate, where if any amplification occurred in one of these reactions, we considered the sample positive. Prevalence of the fungal pathogen was estimated using 95% confidence intervals. And we also explored uh, significant uh, associations between OO and a few different variables. Of those predictive variables, we used them to create a model, to model uh, OO and help predict where it might be. So what we found was that the concha water snake seemingly had the lowest overall uh, pathogen prevalence. Now, this is a little misleading. If we look at the adult prevalence, we see an increase in all three species of Neurodia. Now, remember, I talked about the concha water snake having a, a highly inflated amount of neonates in our captures, and that's kind of what you're seeing here. 
So let's get into it uh, a little bit by comparing to another study. Dr. Harding uh, looked at the relative of the contra water snake. He looked at the Brazos water snake using the same two sympatric congeners. And he looked at it in the Brazos River watershed. Essentially, our studies found a couple of commonalities. We found that prevalence did not significantly differ between Nerodia species, but it was significantly associated with life stage. These adult snakes are more likely to have uh, this pathogen on their skin compared to neonates. Why might this be? Well, adults, for one, are in the landscape longer. They have more opportunity to come into contact with this fungal pathogen. As, and neonates also perform ectysis at a higher frequency, or they shed their skin, which has been uh, shown to be an effective way of ridding the fungal pathogen uh, uh, from their body. When we compare these two watersheds, uh, we see the Brazos watershed had a higher overall estimated prevalence. And we also see a similar pattern with uh, between the Contra water snake and the Brazos water snake. But the Brazos water snake has a uh, much higher pathogen prevalence compared to the Contra water snake. Now, it should also be noted that the uh, Contra water snake has about four times as many samples. Uh, so there may be some uh, uh, sample size uh, causality there. But uh, for the most part, we see uh, the Brazos watershed has higher prevalence estimates. Now, we also asked ourselves, we, we talk about these lakes and river systems with respect to the Contra water snake. Well, what about with the fungal pathogen? Uh, we found that river prevalence was 20% higher compared to our lake prevalence. With some of the river sites, uh, such as the lower and upper Colorado River regions, testing positive 50 to 60% of the time. You also have Elm Creek, which even with 50 samples, almost 50 of those uh, tested positive. Uh, which is much higher compared to our IV reservoir, which sits around 30% of samples testing positive. So why might we be seeing a trend where rivers have higher pathogen prevalence? Well, let's look at it in kind of a simplified model. Uh, you've got this river system on the left. These water snakes do not stray too far from water. It's their specialty. Uh, if they move uh, too far, they'll be exposed to the sun. They can't control their temperature as well, so they need that water to regulate, especially during the Texas summer heat. Uh, and then you also have the prey items. They specialize on fish and amphibians in these river systems, and they use these water systems to escape predators. So essentially, these snakes don't stray too far uh, and are restricted to the confines between these river banks. So we suspect that Snakes moving up and down this river likely have a higher uh, frequency of interactions. We also see a lot more vegetation and therefore a lot more shade. Uh, this uh, cooler uh, shaded habitat promotes fungal growth uh, compared to something that is more sun exposed. So in these river systems, you have higher interaction frequency between snakes and better uh, habitat for this fungal pathogen to grow. So we suspect there's higher transmission in these systems. If you compare that to the Ivy Reservoir uh, you, uh, system, you see on the right, and that is one of the shorelines uh, uh, from Ivy Reservoir, we, it's a lot more open space. And so we suspect that uh, snakes in this system are likely interacting less frequently because they have more open space to move. And we also see there's a lot less vegetation, a lot more sun exposure, which does not help fungal pathogens grow. Uh, so we see that it's likely habitat less suitable for fungal growth and less snake-to-snake -snake interactions results in lower transmission. Now, we talked about uh, modeling OO. We found that our global model was the best fit. We considered water body in the form of lakes versus rivers. We considered season, spring or fall, the presence of lesions, uh, as well as age class. We found a positive relationship of OO uh, with lesions, and this has been well documented in other snake fungal disease studies as well. We had a positive association with, uh, with OO prevalence and rivers, and a strongly negative association with OO presence in neonates. So how can we interpret this, uh, this quick model? It essentially tells us that adult snakes in rivers are more likely to have OO on their skin than neonates in lakes. So back to our study system our study model, uh, we basically see that OO does not significantly differ between these three species of water snake, but it is moderately high. Now, why do I say that? Well, 
we sampled a terrestrial species, uh, rough green snakes, uh, for example, and also a semi-terrestrial uh, species or semi-aquatic species, uh, the uh, ribbon snake. And their samples tested positive between 6 and 8% of the time, which is much lower compared to the 40 to 50% in these uh, water snake species. Now, we also have another important aspect to population monitoring with the concha water snake, and that is the population genetics. There were two prior surveys uh, doing the population genetics on the species that generally found these uh, four things, uh, low genetic diversity in the concha water snake, evidence of population differentiation uh, between these river regions, low effective population sizes. Now, effective population size is a measure used by management agencies to get an idea of how many breeding individuals are currently present in a given area, as well as evidence of population bottlenecks. And I showed you kind of an example of that with Spence Reservoir potentially being an example of a population bottleneck. So we had a few questions uh, when it came to the population genetics. Uh, is there evidence of population structure in the concha water snake? And is there sufficient gene flow occurring between these populations? Now I'll spare you most of the details uh, for the methods on this, but we sampled or used 33 concha water snakes, 18 Nerodia transversa and 17 Nerodia rhombifer with individuals from uh, each representative uh, region. We extracted DNA, quantified, and purified it. We used a next-gen sequencing technique, DDRAD sequencing, to get information from the whole genome, uh, the nuclear genome. And then we uh, sent it out for sequencing and filtered the information. And we have the results for, uh, for you, and we'll dig into some of those now. Uh, essentially, what we found was allelic richness was highest in the lower Colorado River and lowest in the Concho River. We found the same trend with observed heterozygosity, which was generally low, uh, as well as the same with gene diversity. That's the HS. In the bottom, we have an FST table. If you're not familiar with FST tables, this tells us how different these populations are genetically. And so a number that is closer to one would tell us it's very uh, different. A number closer to zero tells us there's not much difference between these populations. You'll notice in our lower Colorado River region, in the upper section, we're looking at the green section for the concha water snake, it's negative. Negative values can be interpreted as zeros. Uh, this is uh, a result of only capturing three snakes from that entire region. But what we should note is that the concha water snake has higher uh, differentiation occurring when we look at the ivy reservoir population. So this reservoir population is genetically differentiating from the upper Colorado River region and the Concho River region. That's an interesting trend that we'll, we'll touch on in a sec. If we look at the, the blue, we see it's uh, an FST table for Nerodia transversa. If we want to try to extrapolate some of the information from the lower Colorado River region, we can see that uh, with Nerodia transversa, that's where most of our genetic differentiation occurred which tells us that there's maybe some difficulty for snakes to uh, uh, navigate past this dam that is blocking the upper region from the lower region. So let's get in another way to look at this genetic data. This is a principal components analysis. Essentially, each dot represents an individual concha water snake. Each individual has genotype information across a variety of loci. These are all compressed down into the two-dimensional uh, plane that you see in this plot before you. The colors are coordinated to the site the individuals were captured from, and the circles are 95% confidence intervals. Essentially, we see some differentiation occurring, especially with the green ivy reservoir population, which is kind of towards the bottom there. We also see that the sole population of concha water snakes that we discovered on the Concho River uh, may not be as connected to this ivy reservoir population as we once thought. Now you'll see those 95% confidence intervals are overlapping, which tells us that there may be some admixture or gene flow occurring between these populations. But before we get into another way of looking at that, let's look at our other two sympatric congeners. And what we notice is a similar trend. We see that these uh, individuals caught from reservoir populations tend to cluster on their own. Yeah, in Nerodia rhombifer, uh, on the upper end of the y-axis, we have the green ivy reservoir population up there, as well as the uh, orange or yellow Spence reservoir uh, population kind of separating on their own. And then we look at Nerodia transversa, we see a similar trend, but with Nerodia transversa, we see a lot more 
uh, overlap, which tells us that gene flow uh, in this species may be higher relative to some of the other species. Now, this differentiation in uh, reservoir populations is something that was seen in the prior uh, genetic survey on this species. With uh, in Geneca in 2021, found that Ivy reservoir individuals, which are the purple ones on the left hand of that plane, uh, differentiated from the green and blue river populations. So that's an interesting trend that we'll try to dig into and dissect in a little bit. Another way to look at gene flow uh, is using a structure plot. Uh, essentially, each circle represents an individual conjure water snake. Each color represents a genetic cluster. Here we have a population at k equals 4. And at k equals 4 is to say it's the uh, four different regions or populations. We have the lower Colorado, the Concho River, and the upper Colorado, and the Ivy Reservoir population. Essentially, when we see this, we see uh, that each, uh, bar, each little pie chart tends to have multiple colors. And that tells us that there's probably some mixture, some admixture or gene flow occurring in these parts. If we saw high degrees of structure and no gene flow, you may see only orange individuals in the top left or only blue individuals in the Ivy Reservoir or only gray individuals in the Concho River. However, that's not what we see. We do see some degree of admixture. Uh, another way to look at genetic diversity in these species is through mitochondrial haplotypes. Uh, so in the center, we have the Concho water snake. We looked at the COI, 16S, 12S, and ND4 regions of the mitochondrial genome. And what we see is that the haplotype diversity in the Concho water snake is low, especially when you compare it to Nerodia transversa in the blue, which has high haplotype diversity and Nerodia ramifer in orange, which only kind of has a moderate amount of haplotype diversity. So when we go back to our model, we can see that gene flow appears to be sufficient in these three species, at least above the ivy reservoir dam. We see that confirmation again that the concha water snake has lower genetic diversity. Nerodia transversa has high genetic diversity. And Nerodia ramifer kind of only has a moderate amount of at least haplotype diversity. And this may be because we're operating at the extents of this species range. So often when uh, we're working at the extents of a species range, populations are a bit more fragmented, uh, not as many individuals. Uh, so genetic diversity may be lower. And that would be lower, especially when you compare it to uh, part of their region where they're more abundant, more common. So we talked about these uh, reservoir populations kind of differentiating. Let's get a little bit of context to dive in why that might be. All three of these snakes live in the same area and are presumably competing to some degree for the same resources. Uh, each of these uh, species uh, tries to partition each niche, each resource, so that there's not too much competition for the same thing. It's generally considered that the concha water snake, snake feeds primarily on fish and especially minnows while Nerodia transversa feed on amphibians, as well as fish kind of to complement the diet. And finally, Nerodia ramifer, which also consumes fish. Although Nerodia ramifer gets a lot bigger than the concho water snake, so they're tending to consume larger prey species. So one individual that we captured here, pictured, is a juvenile 22-inch Nerodia transversa, which regurgitated 10 whole minnows. We got rid of his buffet on accident. Uh, but among those minnow species, we see uh, species that the concha water snake often prefers to consume. Uh, we also see shifts in these three species when their diets are uh, in their diets when we compare neonates to adults. They kind of eat prey proportional to their size. And so when they're neonates, they're quite limited in the number of fish uh, species that they're able to consume. And these diets kind of broaden as they get older. This was noted in a concha water snake feeding ecology study done by Green, which shows that the concha water snake neonates pretty much only ate minnows. And then as they grew to adults, they included more catfish and more sunfish in their diets. And the same can be said for the both, uh, both of the other species. So it may be that competition uh, between these three species for prey items is highest when they're neonates because they're limited uh, in terms of the number of prey items that they could consume. We also see shifts in diet based on the environment in which these snakes are living. So we have these rivers versus reservoirs. 
We also have this information where genetically these snakes tend to be differentiating in these reservoirs. So what is driving this genetic differentiation? Well, these reservoir habitats are a very different ecosystem compared to rivers, and as such, they're made up of different fish communities. Where multiple species of minnow may be highly abundant in these rivers, especially the riffle systems, they are less common in these reservoirs. Additionally, these reservoirs will host greater abundances of larger fish species like the sunfish, like the catfish. Diet has also been noted uh, again in that green uh, 1994 study that conch water snake diet will differ between reservoirs and rivers based on prey availability and uh, prey abundance. And so uh, really with these shifts in, in community structure, uh, Adult contra water snakes are more likely to succeed in these reservoir habitats because they can consume more of the available prey, such as the catfish, such as uh, the sunfish. But again, they still uh, prefer minnows for the most part. Uh, whereas neonates in this reservoir habitat are more likely to struggle given most uh, of the prey available will be lower, especially compared to what you would find in these river riffle habitats. So I hypothesize these shifts in these prey consumption and the associated hunting strategies for these prey items could be driving some of the different genetic differentiation that we're seeing occur. There is also, as you can see in this image, there's a lot larger fish in these reservoir shorelines. Most of those are, are carp. However, you got a couple big bass there as well. So these neonate snakes are definitely more susceptible uh, or at risk when they're foraging along these uh, shorelines in the reservoir. And so let's touch on that reservoir ecology with these contra water snakes a little bit more. I'd like to discuss some of the components uh, in this image of an individual contra water snake that I photographed after we released it, um, once we got all of the information from it. The snake is sitting on salt cedar, which is a highly invasive species to the water systems in central Texas, and are known to increase sedimentation, soil salinity, and they demand lots of water. We often, uh, when we were surveying, were unable to find very many contra water snakes when salt cedar was dense along the shorelines. They just did, weren't captured in traps. We often didn't find snakes there. Uh, so the presence of salt cedar did not seem to correlate well with contra water snake presence. Now you'll also notice that there is uh, a familiar species to many of you. This is the uh, zebra mussel, another highly invasive aquatic species. When we were scanning the shorelines of Ivy Reservoir, looking under rocks for these uh, contra water snakes, we often observed that these refugia were full of zebra mussels. It could be that these zebra mussels are actually lowering the habitat quality and availability for these contra water snakes in these shoreline areas, specifically neonates that are looking to shelter under these small rocks along the shoreline. So let's wrap things up. Uh, Essentially, what we're seeing is that there is evidence that range contractions are occurring for this species. Snakes may be extirpated from Spence Reservoir, as well as Bend, Texas, further reducing the occupied range of the Concha water snake, which already has one of the smallest ranges of any snake species in the U.S. Now, this uh, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that in the next slide, but we also see uh, evidence of greatly reduced abundance compared to historical surveys throughout their range. Sites where these contra water snakes used to be highly abundant or present at all are no longer. We confirmed that there is moderate to high pathogen prevalence uh, in this species that did not significantly differ between these Nerodia species, but it is much higher compared to other uh, species. Now, there are many uh, unknowns when it comes to snake fungal disease. So this definitely merits further research to understand uh, what the actual impacts to this species are from this uh, disease. We found continued evidence of low genetic diversity in the contra water snake, as well as evidence which shows support that uh, gene flow may be occurring above the ivy reservoir dam. Now, this gene flow uh, we saw that in the nuclear genome, there was a lot more uh, admixture. We saw a little more structure, a little less uh, gene flow in the uh, mitochondrial data. And this is commonly a trend found when a species exhibits female philopatry. So the, the females don't often navigate too far from their birthing sites, as well as male biased dispersal. So these males are out seeking uh, new females to mate with. 
And this is uh, typically a behavior that helps uh, reduce the risk of inbreeding uh, on the species. And so that may be what's occurring in some of uh, the species that we see here. There have been some studies that have noted contra water snakes, uh, males that have moved 15 kilometers in a four year period, as well as uh, juveniles migrating five to six sites from their birthing sites. In terms of the future goals, occupancy modeling, I think it would be a critical component. Uh, we often find that these historical surveys are hindered by their study design and sampling availability. To actually collect, take the time to collect environmental predictors and habitat variables uh, could be critical to understanding where these snakes may be. Uh, like I said, a lot of that lower Colorado River region has gone unsampled. So it could greatly benefit from some occupancy modeling. It could be that water quality is also a, an overlooked component for this species. We see a lot lower abundance of snakes on the Concho River. That is generally a place where we have seen uh, murkier water, fish die-offs on that river. Uh, so it could be that water quality is having a role on that Concho River population. The population that we did find on the Concho River definitely needs more information. Uh, it's the first site that, that has, of Concho water snakes on that river in 10 years. So we need to further understand uh, how much of that river is occupied uh, from that site uh, and get a better sense of how many snakes are actually there. The lower Colorado River, like I said, is mostly privately owned. So more sampling needs to be done, to, especially in some parts which haven't had surveys in over 50 years. Uh, so it would really help us gain insight as to what areas of this concha water snake are actually occupied. The Bend, Texas population. Uh, if the population is still persisting, it would be a great genetic resource for the species. Uh, translocating individuals from Bend to the more central portion of the species uh, range would uh, benefit it in terms of genetic diversity. So uh, if populations are still persisting in Bend, Texas, that would be a great genetic tool uh, for the continued uh, conservation of this species. Uh, but if it is extirpated from this site, then we may see that the shift, uh, the contraction of its range is rather quite significant. Uh, and then lastly, outreach. Local outreach is critical to conducting field work in Texas, as most of us here are aware. The success we found in our research was not possible without the local insight and support from residents. It allows us to operate with a more complete understanding of the system we are working in. And with that, I would like to first and foremost thank Texas Parks and Wildlife for making this project possible uh, and inviting me to talk to you all today about our research. A thank you to Dr. David Rodriguez and Dr. Sarah Fritz from Texas State University for their development of the study and their critical support throughout. A thank you to the Colorado River Municipal Water District for their assistance in the field, making us feel welcome and providing us access to the res reservoir and river sites. A special thanks to Don and Carol Sessom, who were extremely welcoming and supportive. They helped us sample stretches of river I'm sure nobody has uh, sampled before. And a thanks to everyone involved in the field crew for putting their hands and well-being second to capturing these uh, bitey water snakes. And uh, thanks to everyone in the Dr. Rodriguez lab for their personal support with me. So thank you. Great stuff, Tristan. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a, you know, it's not a round of applause there at the end. Um, well, again, really appreciate it. We do have some questions. And so I'd encourage if there are other questions people are thinking about now, we got a, we got about, you know, 10, 15 minutes we can, we can spend on this. Um, so Tristan, the first question is, do you know the origin of the fungus? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, at this time, no studies are looking into that, especially phylogenetic studies to try to see, uh, where it first originated. Uh, but at this stage, it's still up for debate. Now it is, uh, present in not only the U S it's also been found in Asia and in Europe. Uh, so it definitely spans multiple continents. Uh, so again, early stages for this disease, uh, but yeah, don't know exactly where it originated yet. Very good. Um, do you think the concho water snake will be relisted as sensitive? I think that probably means some sort of endangered species uh, um, or state listed. 
as, as it relates to the monitoring criteria alone, uh, that would indicate that there is reason to relist. Uh, a lot of the, I would tend to think yes, given the sharp contrast in where snakes uh, used to be found, especially in abundant numbers uh, compared to now, where we struggle to find snakes, especially in uh, certain parts of their range, important parts of their range. But really, I, I would emphasize that more sampling needs to be done. Some of the time between sampling and surveys uh, is, is too much time, in my opinion. And so we don't really, we kind of have a fragmented picture that we're piecing together. Uh, so we could really benefit from more thorough sampling throughout the species range, rather than just focusing on that core central area. Okay, thanks. Uh, what is the average size and length of a concha war snake? Uh, There's a comment, they look big in the photos. Yeah, so for the most part, they're gonna be around two feet in length for an adult. Uh, three feet in length uh, is kind of the, the bigger end. Uh, three and a half feet, I'd say they don't get much bigger than that. So uh, really they're gonna be smaller than four feet. And these Neurodia rhombifer, you can see one in the, the acknowledgements picture here, they get a lot larger, and and I can I can tell you uh, from firsthand experience, bites from those larger snakes uh, do hurt, and they do draw blood. Awesome. Okay, a couple of questions here about their uh, the snake's role in the ecosystem. Um, sure. Yeah, what role do they play? Uh, a comment here. What warrants this level of research? Um, you know, they're the person making the comment appreciates the snakes, but why do they matter? In quotes, you know. We get this a lot, then we working with uh, rare species. Yeah, so um, I guess, you know, grand scheme, you could say that it, you know, it depends on the scale at which you look at. For you, it, the snake may not matter, uh, but for the system and for the people that are there, uh, the snake absolutely plays a role, just as everything does in, uh, in its ecosystem. And so with these snakes, uh, they don't operate in the same way that you may see, you know, the arguments of, have rat snakes around because they get rid of your rodent problem. They're not quite that uh, directly beneficial to us. However, uh, the one important part about the concha water snake is they occupy these river and water systems. And if you live in Texas, the water is critical uh, for everyone. And so these uh, snake species are kind of an indicator and, and, a, and a, a promoter of good, safe, uh, quality water in these systems. So if we protect the snake, along with that protection comes water protections that benefit everybody involved. Uh, so really that's kind of the key component uh, about this species and why we should care is because uh, they can help us uh, ensure that the water that we are getting is good quality and not degraded and not uh, losing out and, and, and make sure that we actually have a water available to us when these droughts are occurring, when, uh, especially considering when these droughts may be getting longer, may be getting more severe, so. Awesome, thank you. Any chance you could develop a DNA test for the water samples that would reduce the field work intensity? So uh, that's, that's uh, eDNA, uh, environmental DNA. Uh, you probably could develop uh, eDNA testing for this species. I think that, uh, like I said, in, in places where you can't necessarily spend a lot of time sampling, especially in person, because it can be quite demanding, uh, that it would benefit from some of that. Uh, but again, it requires a lot of samples, uh, and, and, and I don't exactly know who, uh, what lab uh, works to process eDNA. Uh, but it could benefit from eDNA, and I think it would work in this system as well. Okay. Um, do we know or how have the snake's food populations changed in recent years? Um, that I'm not sure of. I think if you talked to the Colorado River Municipal Water District, they may have a better indication of fish species and and their uh, abundances uh, throughout that portion of the Colorado and Concho rivers. But me personally, I, I don't know, and I've not uh, found too much literature on that besides the, the reservoir populations. Those uh, host, uh, they try to attract 
fishing and other recreation for uh, tourism. Uh, so they definitely monitor the uh, reservoir populations of fish a lot more closely, uh, I think, uh, or at least more frequently. Uh, so there is that information out there. And uh, the reservoir hasn't been around uh, for so long. You know, 30 years is a relative uh, amount. Uh, so it's hard to say how much that has shifted over time, as well as in these rivers. So I don't know too much. On that same topic, and maybe you don't know, but somebody's asked if those if those lakes are stocked. Do, yes. do you know that? They yes. are. Yeah. Those lakes are are supplemented. Uh, if if especially Ivy Reservoir, which actually was recently, I saw on one of the Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, newsletters or email announcements that it's one of the top five lakes in Texas for largemouth bass fishing. Uh, so uh, they definitely. Uh, Pay close attention to those populations as well as uh, the um, uh, supplement those those stocks if needed. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so you've spoken to the need for more research, but are there any policy or advocacy actions you'd recommend based on your work and the work you've seen happening in this system? Um, that's a great question. Um. By and large, uh, I don't know that I have much say uh, or sway. I'm kind of at the tail end of my work in this system, unfortunately. Uh, but we're still working in this post delisting monitoring plan. And so the Texas Parks and Wildlife and U.S. Fish and Wildlife are paying close attention. Uh, and so they have uh, protocols in place. Uh, if we find that this species needs action. Uh, you also have uh, some interesting uh, benefit coming from uh, the listing of several mussel species. Uh, they were considered endangered and uh, proposed to be listed uh, by US, uh, on U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And, um, and so we may actually indirectly benefit from the protections of these mussel species in these water systems uh, which help us, again, make sure the environment, the water quality is, is better off, which actually supports this contra water snake as well. So there are actually some things occurring in the background to, to help the, uh, this species and this system, although not quite directly yet. Uh, we've got maybe another three to five years of surveys on this species before a final decision is made, uh, but I suspect that it will probably uh, merit more protections or more policy uh, for this species.